Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nate Kleinman. I'm a board member here at NOFA and uh, co-director of the Experimental Farm Network. Um, it is my distinct honor and privilege to uh, introduce one of our keynote speakers today. Um, I hadn't met Dr. Lila D L June Johnston until yesterday, uh, but I've been, uh, it's been an honor and really uh, amazing to see her work as a facilitator today and yesterday. Um, Lila, Dr. Lila June Johnston is an indigenous musician, scholar, and community organizer of Diné uh, Tsetsetsis and European lineage. Um, Diné is erroneously known as Navajo. Uh, Tsetsetsis is also known as Cheyenne. Um, her multi-genre presentation style has engaged audiences across the globe towards personal, collective, and ecological healing. She blends her study of human ecology at Stanford, graduate work in indigenous pedagogy, and the traditional worldview she grew up with to inform her music, perspectives, and solutions. She recently finished her PhD on the ways in which pre-colonial indigenous nations shaped large regions of Turtle Island, AKA the Americas, to produce abundant food systems for humans and non-humans. So please uh, help me welcome Dr. Lila June Johnston. the first time anyone said successes properly, so give them a round of applause as well. So, uh, greetings my relatives and my people. Uh, um, Taos, New Mexico, so my name is Lila June, and I'm from the Nanisht Eje Trachitni clan of the Dene Nation, um, also known as Navajo, uh, incorrectly known as Navajo. Um, and that clan I get from my mother. So in, in Dene culture, you get your last name from your mother, not from your father. So I always like to just say that, no matter what kind of talk I'm giving, because uh, I think honoring our mothers and our, our grandmothers and our matrilineal lines is, is just something for all of us to think about. Um, yes, I've come to, uh, to you all today to, to talk about this really deep passion of mine. It's all about indigenous food systems. It's all about the regenerative nature of indigenous land management. Uh, it's all about debunking the myth of the primitive Indian, which posits that we were just scattered bands of half-naked nomads running around looking for a berry to eat or a deer to hunt, which is not only the narrative that most of America is spoon-fed in, in school, but even us as native people have been taught this narrative about ourselves and we've drank the Kool-Aid as well, thinking that our ancestors were primitive. When in fact, uh, looking at the archeological record, uh, this entire continent was actually densely populated by indigenous cities from coast to coast. Um, and also we wielded extreme and extensive influence on the land, the way that it looked, the way that it tasted, species compositions, all of which I'm gonna get into. And not only that, but we've been here a lot longer than, uh, <laughs> than Western society wanted to, to talk about for a long time. Some of you might have heard about the Bering Strait theory, right? All, all Indians came from Asia. Turns out that's wrong, that's, that's extremely wrong. <laughs> we just found 23,000 your old human footprints in New Mexico at the White Sands National Monument. That's um, uh, 7,000 years before we were supposed to be here, according to the Bering Strait theory. And we even found some mastodon bones that were carved by human hands in near San Diego that are over 100,000 years old. Um, of course, that one, there's all kinds of scientists being like, no, 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 that, that's not human carvings. It's, the bones must have just dropped that way uh, because there's a very deep investment within Western culture to minimize our stay here as native people. Because if we're not really from here, then we're just immigrants too. And you didn't really kill an indigenous people. 
Um, at least that's what my elders tell me, that that's sort of the, the, the motivation behind making us be here very, not very long. Um, and the motivation behind erasing a lot of the native cultivation of the land um, is to kind of like, if you use it, if you use the land, you own the land. That was what John Locke and Thomas More said based on Roman law. If you use the land, you own the land. So because native people were using the land, deeply cultivating it on ecosystemic scales, you know, we didn't plant little orchards, we planted forests. We didn't take care of little oyster farms, we, we took care of whole estuaries. Um, then by their own rules, we owned this land because we were using it. So there's a concerted effort also to minimize the amount of indigenous purposeful cultivation of the land, which was um, ubiquitous throughout this area, as we'll get into. But some of you, this might be uh, uh, old news, some of you might be new news, but um, the notion of wilderness, you know, uh, colonists coming to this land and thinking, wow, look at this natural, pristine, wild virgin land, uh, when in fact, they also would always remark, huh, it looks like a splendid park. It looks park-like, you know, like, like someone built this place. Uh, you always read that in the colonist diaries. And it's because it was, it was a highly curated, highly uh, manicured, clipped, brune, uh, pruned, uh, selected environment that indigenous peoples grew like a massive garden. Um, but don't take my word for it, let's um, get into these case studies. Um, but yeah, this is actually an uh, artist's rendition of actual archeological sites along the Florida riverbanks, showing some of the oyster middens that built up and up and up over time. So this was just a very, very massive uh, oyster um, garden along the Florida riverbanks. And here too, the, the Lenape peoples really oversaw some ancient oyster beds. Uh, which were actually man-made in a sense, or at the very least man-stewarded, um, because in less than 300 years, um, America has managed to decimate the oyster populations along the East Coast. Um, so clearly it's not just a given that these oysters will be there. You have to take proactive action to maintain them. Um, okay, so Architects of Abundance, Indigenous Regenerative Food and Land Management Systems, Humans as a Gift to the Earth, that's sort of the overarching theme of this. This is the Ahupua'a system in Hawaii where they have a food system from the peak to the ocean. These layers, these stratigraphic layers of different types of foods that they would cultivate. Uh, this is the burning of the prairies, which we'll get into, which created buffalo habitat. This is a massive aquaculture project in Bolivia that's over a thousand years old. Um, and this is my people's desert alluvial farming technique. So even though these are all indigenous um, to this area, to this side of the world, I really try to make it more of a human thing than a Native American thing, to say all of us have this in our bones, have this in our DNA, have this as our birthright, to not be, to not only not hurt the earth, to not only not be a pest to the earth, but to actually be a gift and so what we find in the archeological record is that wherever humans were on this continent, with a few exceptions, but by and large, wherever humans were on this continent, they were an asset to the earth. They actually augmented habitat, they augmented biodiversity. And it just goes to show that, and, and these examples are found throughout the world, in Norway, in Africa, in Asia, in the Pacific Islands, in Australia. So this is not a Native American thing, this is a human thing that we have been an asset to the earth on landscape scales, ecosystem level scales, and that means that we can do it again today. So I'm gonna start out in Kentucky. The Kentucky uh, ancestors are the Shawnee, and they had these massive chestnut groves. And as you may know, chestnut was growing from Maine all the way down to Georgia, and has almost been completely wiped out by a blight. And this is because the colonists did not know how to space the trees properly. Um, it's very sad. And also, like, we're bringing it back as much as we can. Um, so 
what happens when you have, this is a Tsalagi or a Cherokee family next to one of their chestnut relatives, just to give you uh, a, an image of how vast, uh, how, how massive rather, these chestnuts were, these old growth chestnuts. And when you allow the chestnut to kind of billow out and be a tree because it's spaced properly, you know, it's spaced far away, then you allow it to have enough sunlight, enough nutrients and enough water to just thrive as a big, beautiful tree. Um, and what you would do in old times is you would burn around the base um, of the chestnut. So you would actually burn all of this, all of this stuff, wait, there it is, all of this. And so that ash would actually go into the soil around the tree, which would help the uh, fertilize the trees. And it would also clear out any competing vegetation, right? You don't want to have a bunch of thickets, uh, bushes, um, small trees trying to come into the picture. So indigenous peoples back in the day would really um, manage and space and select. They're kind of like, you, 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 and you are going to stay, and everything else we're pretty much going to burn in between. And that actually would prevent catastrophic fires because the trees were so spaced apart a forest fire could never really get that much momentum. It would only burn these small fuels at the bottom. Um, and also, importantly, in the wake of those fires was nutrient-dense grasses, right? Because you get that injection of ash into the soil, you stimulate the microbial activity, you increase the water filtration rate when you burn as well. You just create a very healthy living soil. And then you have these grasses that come up, which attract deer, antelope, bison, et cetera. So you have your chestnuts and your protein all in one system. And um, this is an interesting graph. And before I go into it, don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through it. It looks weird and scary, but it's actually one of my favorite graphs, maybe ever. Um, <laughs> so this is time. This, this red line is 3,000 years ago. So what they did was they took a soil core out of the earth and it had 9,500 years worth of information in it. This is found in a Kentucky pond where supposedly there were no Indians. Maybe you've heard of the dark and bloody ground theory that says there was no Indians in Kentucky. They would just walk through and hunt every now and then. Everywhere else there were, but not in Kentucky. That's another uh, settler move to innocence, right? We didn't kill anyone here. There was nobody here to kill. Um, anyways, so 3,000 years ago, we have, oh yeah, this is the most recent layer of the sediment, right? And as you get deeper down into the sediment, it gets older. So this is, a, it was only about two, not even two meters long, and it has so much information in it. So what you see is cedar kind of goes away. Oh, this is fossilized pollen, right? So you have the presence or absence of different species throughout time. So cedar kind of goes away. Oak makes a huge comeback, and look at this chestnut. Hmm, just a whole bunch of chestnut going on. Hickory nut, black walnut comes out of nowhere about 2,000 years ago. Hmm, we got some sump weed coming in, some goosefoot, sunflower, all these edible and medicinal plants. And then here we have your fossilized charcoal. And the way that scientists interpret this graph is that about 3,000 years ago, the ancestors of the Shawnee moved in and transformed it into a biodiverse food forest with the use of periodic seasonal burning to maintain spacing and healthy lands, soils, grasses, and sustained it for 3,000 years until the blight came along and wiped out the chestnut. I've actually been to this pond. That's how much of a nerd I am. I don't, I don't want autographs from musicians, I just want an autograph from the pond. I want you to tell me, you know, what's your story, pond? But no, I, I, I was really happy to check out this pond. Um, so now we're gonna go to a different case study, which is the um, clam gardens of the Pacific Northwest. This is a, a rock wall that was created by indigenous peoples. Um, these rock walls are also 3,000 years old. Um, there's another rock wall. And so what you do when you build this wall is when the high tide comes up and when it recedes, that wall captures sediment. Oh, thank you, appreciate that. Um, yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it's a nice one too. 
um, captures sediment and water, and it creates clam habitat. So it's really interesting how humans can augment habitat. And when they would augment this habitat, they would increase the amount of clams that were available in the system. And when they increased the amount of clams, they also helped other species, like the otter, the mink, and the water birds would eat the clams too. So they always say that this system was not just for humans alone, it was to benefit all life. And, and Quadra Island, um, about 35% of, of the coastline, we find these um, rock walls. So they weren't just augmenting a little bit of clam habitat, they were augmenting dozens and dozens of kilometers, square kilometers of, of clam habitat um, with their bare hands. So here's the rock wall as well. And so it's, it's kind of amazing how with these human hands, we can actually eco-engineer these places that are not quite a farm, it's not fully domesticated and controlled, but it's also not just completely wild nature either. It's maybe somewhere in between. I don't know, I haven't found a good word for it yet. Maybe semi-domestication, I don't know. But really working with nature, working with what's going on, observing where the clams like to live and replicating those, um, those types of environments. Um, so I like to talk about that. Again, 3,000 years old. I mean, this is an ancient, ancient system. Um, so we've been gardening and farming a long, long time. So I like to talk about Native American grassland pyromanagement because uh, the, the grasslands, uh, that, which are now an endangered habitat in the US, uh, really owe their life to indigenous burning. Um, so one guy wrote, the Illinois Confederacy shaped and altered much of this region as an anthropogenic creation. Like many other indigenous groups in North America, their most important tool was fire. Burning the prairies, they made the grasses hospitable for grazers and managed prairie as a game reserve to maximize productivity. Now what that means is essentially, we didn't really need to um, fence in or, or cage in cows or protein animals. We actually would just burn areas which would spring up nutrient dense grasses and they would come to us. So we attracted herbivores to us um, and it's really amazing how when you open up these meadows and you open up these prairies, you actually create space for a lot of different animals. Um, and not only that, but fire was so important to native peoples and still is today that we even would name one of our moons after it. The lunar calendars have these um, uh, really important indicators of what we used to do throughout the cycle of the year. So. The Miamia nation, they have a lunar calendar as well, and they have the grass burning moon. And so that corresponds to our Gregorian September. And so this is the time when the Miamia nation, who you might have heard of, they're really wonderful people uh, who live in the Ohio River Valley, would go out and burn. And so that's how important burning was and is to indigenous peoples, is it was institutionalized through our lunar calendars that, okay, it's time to go burn. And this is one thing that the Miamia have published recently. They said, in Sasha Kayolia Kilswa, or the grass burning moon, we see fire as something that restores and gives new life to the prairie. Fire helps clear the land of old grass and brush and open seed pods that have fallen to the ground. Because of fire, new flowers and plants emerge in the spring. And fire was such, and still is, even though we're not allowed to do it as much, such an important way of you could say farming, because when we burn, we attract all of our protein to us. And a lot of people imagine, you know, Native Americans chasing the buffalo and running around the plains. But now we know uh, that more so, the buffalo was, were chasing us. They were chasing our fire as we opened up um, uh, bison habitat as far east as Pennsylvania and as far south as Louisiana, there was bison all over. Um, this is a really quite a good book called Forgotten Fires. It was actually written in 1908 by Omer Stewart, um, and he was an exceptionally nerdy guy. He really went through every 
scrap of paper he could find that talked about native people burning the land and put it in a book in 1908. So there's lots of old citations from the 1700s, et cetera, including talking about here in the Northeast of how important fire was to native peoples. Um, and I think he said transient wilderness kind of to say like, it wasn't really wilderness, you know? It never stayed wild for very long. It was a human co-creation with nature, with fire as the agent to, to create these changes. And this area in Texas where these bison are, I've actually been to this same spot uh, today, and it's really shrubby. It's really like a messic forest. And so when we don't burn, um, things usually collapse into shrubland and, and these thickets. Like even around here maybe, when you go out into like nature, it's hard to get through, right? Um, and that's actually not really the way it used to be for thousands of years. That's another thing colonists always remark in their diaries is that the traveling was so easy. We could just travel anywhere because these meadows were open for miles and miles and miles in between the old growth trees. Um, so a lot to say there, but I'm gonna go to Bolivia. Okay, so the Baure people of Bolivia did this extraordinary floodplain aquaculture system, which was pretty much destroyed in the 1500s. But what they did was they created these earthen berms, these earthen walls that acted as fish weirs. So in the rainy season, the water would go up, and in the dry season, they would kind of funnel the water and the fish to places they wanted. And they would also funnel them into pools. So they would create these reservoirs that were um, creating a perennial supply of fish, uh, even in the dry season. They would plant these fruit trees on the earthen berms, which would attract game animals. So you would also have protein hanging out, uh, even though it, you know they're not just protein, they're our relatives, they're our beloved relatives. Um, and you also have apparently a lot of snails, escargot. So this was this huge food system that went on in Bolivia for a very long time. They also had canals, so this is an artist rendition of a canal system. Um, but they also had uh, settlement mounds, so when it rained really hard, they wouldn't get wet. Uh, forest islands, where they have some like agroforestry going on. Reservoirs, fish weirs, et cetera. The raised fields, you know, they'd raise up um, some earth to make their agriculture fields and ring ditch sites. So they basically created a water world where they would really harness and work with the floods that would come in and out. And floodplains in general are a very ripe place to create these semi-domesticated food systems that are on landscape scales. If you just work with the kinetic energy of the land and the water, you don't have to do as much work. Um, so these are some aerial photographs of some of the ancient fish weirs and walls that were created. And mind you, this has been degrading for 500 years, and we can still see remnants of it, which um, in the jungle is kind of incredible. So just imagine what it looked like in its heyday. Um, and the area they managed was quite extensive. You know, this black uh, dotted line was the amount of floodplains, like a good chunk of Bolivia that was anthropogenically managed. Um, and that's why I kind of like to steer us away from the term hunter-gatherer, because Native Americans, the last thing we were were hunter-gatherers. Because in my mind, a hunter-gatherer is someone who's like, hoping they find a berry, you know, hoping they find a deer uh, to hunt. Whereas I think our systems were extremely predictable and extremely cultivated and extremely curated and extremely, you could say, engineered um, in, a, in the most respectful way that we could. Um, and, and these systems were lasting on the order of thousands of years. So clearly they were not damaging things too much. They were successful and they kept going. Um, but a lot of people think that if there's no pyramids or castles or aqueducts, then there was no people here. But actually, we very intentionally oftentimes didn't leave behind huge marks on the earth because if you left huge marks on the earth, it meant you had done something disrespectful. So almost by definition, you, you won't find a lot of um, in, in our most advanced societies, we didn't leave a trace. 
but the traces we did leave were more ecological traces, more um, you know, oyster middens and uh, fossilized pollen records and things like that. That's the mark we left. And so now with this new lens on, that honors that native people were not just hunter-gatherers, but they were farming the whole ecosystem, farming the whole forest, then they're able to find a lot more evidence to, to understand what really happened here. So this is more in my territory. This is in the deserts. So the Ashiwi people, or the Zuni Pueblo people, had something called runoff agriculture. It's also called alluvial farming. But what happens is you plant your gardens at the base of small watersheds. And if you've ever been to New Mexico or Arizona, where I'm from, you'll know that the monsoons are really beautiful and powerful and brief. <laughs> you kind of need to, to, to catch that water when you can. So we would put our fields at the base of these watersheds to just kind of catch that little flood, uh, these ephemeral floods. Um, so you maybe would make like a brush dam to slow and spread the water. That's what we talk about in permaculture, right? Uh, they were doing that for thousands of years. And some of these um, uh, fields are radiocarbon dated to be over a thousand years old. Of, we've been working the same plot of land for a long, long time. And the reason we can do that is because every time it rains, it not only brings water into the field, it also brings fertilizers because up in these upland soils, there are a lot of soil organic matter, phosphorus, nitrogen, nutrients, plant litter, et cetera. And so every time it rains, it also brings a little injection of fertilizer into the field. So that's how we managed to plant and grow on the same plot of land for a long, 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 long time without ever having to leave it fallow for too long or at all because it was consistently being replenished with both water and, and fertilizers. So um, here's our corn in the desert, you know. You can make the desert into a garden with these techniques, these alluvial farming techniques. And so I just love, love, love that my people did this. Um, so anyways. Going to Australia, um, we have these 6,000-year-old eel farms, which I find really fascinating. So basically, the eel is a catadromous species, meaning it spawns in the ocean. And then when it hatches, it goes into freshwater, the opposite of a salmon. And so as it's going back and forth from the salt water to the freshwater, you know, these people lived here tens, uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of years. They notice, oh, there's the eel again. There's the eel again. <laughs> there's the eel again. And so they created these little eel um, funnels, these little eel pathways, and they created little eel nurse nurseries <laughs> where they would have the little eel, uh, I think they're called elvers. I love that word, elver. It's, it's a word for a baby eel. Um, so they had these little elver pools, and they would um, not harvest the strongest, fastest first eel. You would harvest the last eel. And that's how they actually supported the genetic selection of eel that would continue onward. So we're talking 6,000 years of eel farming. Um, it was drained for a cattle farm, this particular eel farm, uh, 100 years ago. So they drained the whole system. They destroyed it, everything. And just within the last decade, it was revitalized and the eel are coming back. So it's a very exciting success story. And it has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and actually, Jack, did I get your name right? Jack was just talking about the oyster farms here in the Len old Lenape oyster farms, as well as the old Lenape fish weirs that we find in the Delaware River and how they ought to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site too because they were doing the same thing for just as long. Um, and so it really flies in the face of this notion of um, native people kind of just wandering the earth hoping, a victim of circumstance, hoping they find a, an apple or something. Um, but really that we had kind of crafted this very predictable food system. Um, oh yeah, here's a little ear, eel trap that they weave and the eel Swims in and boom, you got dinner. So um, a really important thing about this, however, is that in the literature, when you read the elders' stories, they say the eel is our relative. 
the eel is our responsibility. We have to protect the eel. The eel feeds us, but that means we have a responsibility to make sure its waters are clean, make sure it can go up and down to its spawning directions and maturing grounds. We have to be uh, reciprocal in nature. So I know it might seem kind of mean to trap these eel and eat them, and, but there is actually a deep respect, believe it or not, between these people and the eel. And that's how it sustained itself for 6,000 years. Going to the American South, the anthropogenic cane ecosystems. I don't know if you guys know too much about cane, but um, it's, it's, a, it's an indigenous bamboo species, indigenous to this land. And cane is so important to native peoples. It's so important to the ecosystems. And unfortunately, it's about down to about 2% of its original habitat in the South. And the interesting thing about cane is it's a lot like chestnuts. If you let it grow on its own devices and let it become these thickets, it'll choke itself out of limited nutrients, sunlight, and water. And so it'll collapse into itself. But what folks would do is they would burn. They would burn chunks of the cane. They would uh, harvest chunks of the cane, and that would open up the canopy, would open up sunlight. The burning of the ashes would uh, feed the root systems of the cane. And cane are an interesting species that they grow back faster and more numerous after fire. So fire actually stimulates their growth. Um, and cane was so important to the people. It's kind of like how bamboo today, we use it for beds, for you know, um, pillows, for paper, for, uh, you probably can find underwear made out of bamboo. I don't know, it's just everything can be made out of bamboo. And so similarly, they make quite a few things out of bamboo as well in the Southern territories. Um, this is a really famous art form of cane weaving, cane basket weaving of Muscogee people. Uh, arrows, flutes, adornments, rafts, uh, housing, of course, was made out of bamboo. And so the bamboo was very much also a forage for the bison. Uh, bison was found throughout Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, believe it or not. Um, and so it was really important as the humans would burn the cane, the cane would come back, which would feed the buffalo. Then the buffalo would feed the humans, which allowed them to keep burning the cane, which allowed the cane to keep feeding the buffalo, which allowed the buffalo to keep feeding the humans. And so there was kind of a cyclic relationship between human fire, cane, and the bison. And here's the, what we call the bison belt. This is the uh, presence of bison throughout the US. We often think of them just in, oh, South Dakota, North Dakota, a little bit of Canada. No, there was bison all over the place. And you can see right here, bordering New Jersey, who knows, maybe it was in New Jersey. I do know this map is a little off because right here is where I live. And we have a little town called Iyambito, which means bison springs because there used to be bison there. So I know that this map is at least this much area had bison and probably more. So yes, the cane systems, like I said, are now dwindled down to 2% of their original uh, area. And have you ever heard the term raising cane? Well, that comes from when the colonists would see cane, they would know that there was really good soil underneath. And because it had been burned so many times, there was so much ash, so much nutrient-dense soil organic matter, that they would burn it down and plant their cash crops. So uh, one of the big drivers for the destruction of cane habitat was the cotton industry in the South, destroying the cane breaks. Um, and there's two types of cane, major ones, by the way. There's um, the giant cane, and then there's the switch cane. And both of them are very important for um, indigenous uh, economies. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it's, it's on the rebound, though. Maybe you guys have heard of Marcus Cloud in Alabama, but him and his Muscogee relatives have just purchased over 1,000 acres in Alabama, and they've returned bison to Alabama and they're honoring the cane, and they've also brought back sturgeon to Alabama. He started an eco-village, a, a Muscogee language immersion eco-village. So if there's any Muscogees in the crowd, you gotta go. It's in Weagofka, Alabama, and they're reclaiming their traditional ancestral lands where they were kicked out during the, the Trail of Tears. So they're going back home, um, as are the buffalo. They brought the buffalo with them, so it's very exciting. Um, so uh, I like to talk about the Chesapeake Bay 
um, and the Piscataway Ancestral Oyster Fisheries. Um, there are records now that there was uh, oyster farming there for 2,000 years straight without end. Um, and this was just published recently. Well, actually not too recently, but when I first started my PhD, it was recently. Uh, <laughs> ancient Native American methods may be key to sustainable oyster harvests. Mm -hmm. So that's something Native people have been saying for 500 years, but now that the Smithsonian said it, <laughs> it's like, okay, people will listen. Well, whatever, we'll take what we can get. But um, <laughs> um, there were some nerds who looked at these oyster shells and measured them, radiocarbon dated them, and they found, yeah, over 2,000 years of sustainable oyster harvests. Not only that, but these oyster shells got larger over time. So not only was this uh, stewarded, but uh, arguably it was improved over time. Um, and again, um, I don't think this is a given. You could say, oh, well, that's not a native farm. That's just wild oysters growing, and they just hunter-gathered them. Um, but I think they actually did have a very heavy hand in not only stewarding the oyster area, but also augmenting it. Um, because in less than 300 years, the oysters have gone down to less than 1% of their original population in the Chesapeake Bay. So if it was just such an easy, wild thing, then why can't America also sustain this? Um, and oysters are really interesting because they filter the water. Um, so I'd love to encourage all of us as we think about farming to also think about <sighs> ecosystemic farming, uh, honoring the natural processes that are going on around us and thinking not just in little plots of land, but thinking on ecosystemic scales and becoming farmers not only of small areas, but of, of the earth itself. Uh, gardeners of the earth. Um, oh, it's working again, okay. <laughs> so the Heltzuk people are north of Vancouver and they plant kelp forests along the coastline with their bare hands. And these kelp forests and hemlock boughs, they'll, they'll take big pine boughs, hemlock boughs, and dip it into the coast as well. This will create a substrate for all of the herring to lay their eggs along the coastline. So in this manner, they actually augment the amount of surface area that the herring can lay their row. And that augments the number of herring that are available next season. So they have a direct hand in actually not only augmenting the herring, here's a herring spawning, um, and here's a herring on hemlock. Uh, this is a delicacy. Um, it has a, like a pine flavor. Um, but they're also augmenting all of the species that feed on the herring, which is not just humans. It's killer whales, it's salmon, it's bald eagle, it's wolves, it's bears, up the food chain. Everything begins with the herring, the herring fish and their eggs. And it's so important that their entire year starts in February. Their new year is in February when the herring come. Uh, to lay their eggs. And so it's very exciting when the herring come because it's starting a whole new season for not just humans, but all life. And I think that's a really big tenant of indigenous food systems is we're not centering humans. We're planting things so that all life around us can benefit. And that's a big key difference, I think, of indigenous food systems and conventional food systems is that it is truly not just for us. Whereas the farm is oftentimes very human centric, right? How can I get my profits up? How can I help humans? How, how can I help, which is a, is a worthy thing too, to help humans and help community members. But sometimes it's not even that, it's to help the CEO's uh, pocketbook, you know, it's to help the corporation grow bigger. Um, but these systems were very like, you could call it community sustainable agriculture, but it wasn't just humans who were in the community, it was, all living beings. It really was to feed everything around them. So they plant the, oops, they tie the uh, giant kelp, fast growing kelp, I think it grows like a meter a week or something crazy like that. Um, they um, tie it to these uh, lines these days, drop it in the water and it will create also this spawn on kelp, which is another delicacy. I've eaten it, it's quite good. Uh, maybe a bit of an acquired taste, but I liked it ultimately. and. Um, so they, they, um, they really augment the, the food bearing capacity of the coast. And to think that 98% of them were wiped out during colonization of Heltzuk people. So imagine how much 
life they're creating now, imagine how much more life they were creating when more of their people were up and down the coastline. Because when you damage the indigenous population, you damage everything they uphold, which is so much when you have thousands of years of stewardship. So this is a snapshot of the A horizon. <laughs> it's massive, you know, just very, very deep topsoil. So this guy is showing off his loamy soil that his ancestors have been working on for a couple thousand years and growing his traditional crops. And yeah, so the Membengokre peoples uh, and their neighbors, every one of these black dots, and you can see this is a sizable chunk of the entire continent of South America, uh, is where we find Amazonian dark earths. So we're talking landscape scale influence of the soil quality of the entire Amazon River Basin. And I love to kind of end with this one just to show the sheer magnitude of indigenous gardening and farming and influence on the land. And I can tell you, even though it's not as well researched, this exact same thing happened right where we are standing. And it's controversial to research the soil, right? Because again, if they used it, then they owned it. And so if native peoples created the, the fertile Jersey soils that everyone loved so much, uh, or even the Dust Bowl, right? You think about that constant burning of the plains and the prairies, bringing that ash into the soil. Uh, you think about how when the colonists came to Nebraska or Oklahoma and all these places, they're just like, wow, this is such splendid natural soil. I'm gonna plant a bunch of wheat. I'm gonna till it all up. Um, and they actually might not have realized they were tilling up an ancient heirloom of our people, a soil system that our grandfathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, grandmothers had handed down to us through constant burning of the land uh, to create these, and, and not just burning, right, but a lot of buffalo uh, poop, right? <laughs> a lot of buffalo poop going into the soil. Um, and that together created these really biodiverse pyro-adapted landscapes. Um, and you think about the Oglala Aquifer, which is from Canada down to Texas. Uh, when you think about how burning actually increases the sponginess of the soil, the water filtration rates of the soil, you could argue that indigenous peoples helped to recharge the Oglala Aquifer faster and faster and faster by the soil systems that they created through indigenous burning. So again, it's not as well researched here in the United States. It's kind of safer to research it in South America, right? <laughs> you have a lot of American researchers of like, oh yeah, they did this, but it's kind of harder to, I think maybe I'm wrong, but almost might be harder to admit that, that America is the same thing because then we have to admit that um, we, we destroyed quite a bit and that native people did garden this land um, and, and that we weren't the stupid uh, primitive savages that they said we were, <laughs> but we were actually extremely adept soil scientists and, and among other things. So anyways, um, I just have a few more minutes here. I'm almost done. I like to show this because uh, I wanna show again, it's a human thing. It's not a Native American thing. This happened all over the planet. Intentional fire management in the Holocene with emphasis on hunter-gatherers in the Mesolithic in Norway. Holocene means 11,000 years ago to today. That's a very long time frame. So this is an ancient fire practice of Norway. And if you read this next quote I'm gonna show you, it sounds almost exactly like the Illinois Confederacy quote. Um, Anthropogenic burning was different from natural fires. The fires set by Norwegian people were smaller and less intense. They were predictable, almost immediately productive, creating mosaics in a complex pattern of vegetation of burnt and unburnt patches. Because they reduced available fuel, they provided protection against the disruption of natural fires. So the last sentence is talking about how the more you burn, the more you prevent catastrophic fires, right? Because you're burning down the fuel load in the forest, you're keeping everything chill, so that if a big fire comes along, it doesn't have much to burn, so no big fires come along. And this sentence is actually really interesting because this is exactly what we see in Australia with the Mardu Aboriginal peoples, is that you burn a patch here, you let it regrow for a year, then you burn a patch here, you let it regrow for a year. Meanwhile, this one's grown back two years now. And then you'll burn a patch over here, let it regrow for a year. So, so you're burning different patches each season. So each one is in a different stage of regrowth. 
Each one has a different set of flora and fauna. And so that's actually how you can create biodiversity is by patch burning. Because a lot of ecosystems do this successional growth thing, right? Where like one year they'll have this stuff and the next year they'll have this stuff and et cetera. So um, these scientists found a lot of different biodiversity after the Norwegian burning. Um, so yeah, I just really like to show this. And same in Africa, there's so many recent studies, older studies about indigenous Africans really using fire to burn the savannas, to maintain um, the different herbivore populations. And so this is really much um, a human heritage, not just a Native American thing, but all of us were, I would say, gardeners of the land in some form, and many of us still are. So I like to call this indigenous regenerative ecosystem design because I couldn't quite figure out words for it, right? There's not really English words for this. You could say farming, but it doesn't, but you also don't want to say hunter-gatherer. So I was just trying to find a word that could maybe um, distill it into something. And the design part is really important, right? Because design implies intentionality. Design implies that it was had foresight. Design implies that we were really trying to create a certain thing which is much different than what most of the literature said in the 1700s, 1800s, that native peoples were wandering nomads, right? We're just hoping to, you know, live to the next, to see the next day, you know, <laughs> instead of these very designed systems. All right. So with this, I like to say that Homo sapiens is a gift to the earth. We can be a gift to the earth. And in a sense, humans can be an emissary of the creator. We can be agents of the creator. Because as indigenous peoples, we believe that the creator loves the earth and is trying so hard to care for the earth. But because we have free will, we use our power sometimes not for creator's vision. But that we can create creator's vision if we remember our responsibility to be stewards of the land. In the Yoruba language, the word for human being is uh, it means chosen one. But that's not because we were chosen to be so important. It's because we were chosen, I heard one Yoruba elder say, to be the stewards of the earth. Creator chose us, so you, you guys, you take care of this spot, you know? You guys take care of this spot. And any indigenous group you meet, almost across the board, they'll say, Creator put us here to protect and care for this land. And that divine assignment to homeland is part of indigenous regenerative ecosystem design. So it's not so much the human that's the problem, but maybe our software. Our bodies can wield immense beauty, and our bodies can wield immense destruction, depending on the program that we're programmed with, the software that uh, really dictates our behavior and how we operate in the world. So I've really been wanting to uh, help people learn about a different kind of software, which all of you are already doing, you know. But um, this software of respect, re uh, reciprocity, restraint, relationality, responsibility, regeneration, reverence. You could argue that this is the indigenous software. This is the value system, the rudder that steers our ship. And when this is our value system, all else follows suit. So imagine if our banking system operated based on these value systems. Imagine if the, if the entirety of the US food system operated on these values. Imagine if our universities truly deeply through and through operated on these values. It's such a core important part of who we are is our value system, our software. Um, and I like to give this example of one indigenous software. This is the Anishinaabe Seven Grandfather Teachings. Uh, wisdom, love, respect, bravery, truth, honesty, humility. So this is sort of their seven grandfather teachings that they teach every kid. Like these seven things, you gotta get these ones right. <laughs> you, know? you can do any other things, but you gotta really get these seven things right in your life because this is what's gonna give you and your community a good life. This is just an example, and they have little animals to go along with each one, which makes it even cooler. Um, I didn't notice Sasquatch is real. Um, <laughs> so that's that. I'm gonna sing a little song, if that's all right. Thank you for listening to my talk, appreciate it. So
so yes, uh, moral of the story is um, there is hope. We are good. We are designed to be good. And we can be so good to our Earth on, on monumental scales. You know, we think about the um, human population, 8 billion, as a problem. I don't think the 8 billion are a problem. I think this, the software, the program that they're operating on is a, is a problem. If we had 8 billion people working towards regeneration, working towards you know, re reciprocal practices, farming the land, gardening the land, because a lot of people say, oh, that's cute, Lila, but how are we going to operationalize that? How are we going to create that in today's world? I say, well, get those 8 billion people off their butts and doing something, because we could do quite a bit of damage with that many people. Um, OK, here we go. I like to sing a song, too, at the end, because it's less intellectual. Indigenous people, shine your light, we are equal, yeah, yeah. I remember the days when our prayers were illegal. I remember the days when being Indian was lethal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people, yeah. Rise up, all you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I could feel it in my heart, can you feel it in your blood? I could hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. All nations rise. Rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. With forgiveness as my bow and my prayers as my arrows, pull it back and let it go. We watch them fly like sparrows. Have hope, have hope. With compassion as our shield and faith down to our marrow, we will walk the pollen path even when it gets narrow. Yeah, yeah. Resurrect. Yes, you can bet that we've seen the single mama raising children on the res. We've seen domestic violence tear apart what we have left. We've seen the alcohol take it all and leave us dead. We've seen the children take their own lives when they can't take the dread anymore. Can't take the dread anymore. Or no, we won't take the dread anymore. Cause we can't take the dread anymore. Yes, it's a war, but we've seen it all before, and now we know we can change it, cause that's why we were born. We know we are the ones that we have been waiting for. Yes, we are the ones that grandma has been praying for, so rise up. All you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I could feel it in my heart, can you feel it in your blood? I could hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. Pueblo hermoso, levántense, es nuestro tiempo. No tienes que esconderte más, porque ahorita es nuestro tiempo. This next verse is in Spanish to honor all the indigenous peoples who live south of that imaginary border uh, that has divided a continent that was once very much connected. Mujer indígena, tú eres tan sagrada y traigas medicina de tu suelo todavía a pesar del abuso de tu raza venerable yo respeto tus ritos tus danzas tus padres guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz si sí, no vamos a escondernos más we are warriors of love we are warriors of peace and we will not hide ourselves anymore 
All nations rise, rise up cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore cause now's our time. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for taking the time to honor this knowledge and uh, Got to give a big shout out to the Lenape Nation who had a gorgeous uh, conversation this morning and whose land we're standing on. And uh, they're, they're here amongst us today. Thank you all for leading the way. And you know, definitely see what ways we can stand behind the Lenape if we are not Lenape like myself in any way we possibly can to not only heal the soil, but to heal the past as well. So thank you all for your time. Have a good day.